Coming up on New Day at Arirang. EU nations accuse Russia of using natural gas to blackmail their countries after Russia's state-controlled energy giant Gazprom announced it will stop supplying gas to Poland and Bulgaria. Meanwhile, Russia agrees in principle to UN and Red Cross involvement in evacuations from Mariupol. Top U.S. infectious disease expert Anthony Fauci said the U.S. is out of the full-blown pandemic phase, but added the virus still poses a threat. President-elect Yoon sung yeol says Biden's upcoming visit to Seoul will be an opportunity to bolster the bilateral alliance in a comprehensive manner. Hello and welcome to New Day at Arirang. It's Thursday, April 28th, 8 a.m. here in Seoul, South Korea. I'm Woo Seung. And I'm Yi Seung Jae. Thanks as always for tuning in this morning because over the next hour, we'll be giving a look at some of the biggest headlines of the day and of course get our experts' insights on some of the key issues facing Korea and the rest of the world. Our top story this morning, following Russia's decision to stop gas supplies to Poland and Bulgaria, European leaders criticized Moscow for weaponizing gas. Stressing there is solidarity among European countries, the European Union said Poland and Bulgaria will re now be receiving gas from EU neighbours. Kim Yo-sun has more. Russia has halted gas supplies to Poland and Bulgaria for rejecting its demand for payment in rubles as well as tough sanctions. The decision has been denounced by many European countries as, quote, blackmail. The European Union, in response, vowed to work to ensure that the supply cut would have the least possible impact on consumers. Both Poland and Bulgaria are now receiving gas from their EU neighbors. And this shows, first of all, the immense solidarity among us, but it also shows the effectiveness of past investments, for example, in interconnectors and other gas infrastructure. The U.S. also criticized Russia's latest move. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said that such steps involving weaponizing energy supplies was predicted. Poland says it will do everything to impose contractual fines on Moscow, while also urging the European Union to take collective action. We are not going to pay in rubles for Russian gas. We appeal to all our partners in the EU not to pay in rubles for Russian gas. We urge for the creation of a special customs mechanism for gas and oil coming from Russia, so that Russia can't easily acquire other markets. We also appeal for the introduction of so-called secondary sanctions. As Russia continues to use gas as a weapon, the UN chief arrived in Ukraine following talks in Moscow, saying that the UN will continue to expand humanitarian support and secure the safe evacuation of civilians. Secretary General Antonio Guterres stressed that the sooner the war ends, the better for Ukraine, Russia and the entire world. Amid these developments, Russian President Vladimir Putin warns that any countries attempting to, quote, interfere in Ukraine will face a swift response from Moscow. While addressing lawmakers, he emphasized that Russia has all sorts of tools at his disposal that the West don't have. Kim Yo-san, Arirang News. South Korea is set to send li liquidified natural gas to Europe as the region faces an energy shortage crisis due to Russia cutting off energy supplies. According to Reuters, citing a source with direct knowledge of the matter, some of South Korea's supplies of LNG will be diverted to Europe this summer. The source added the request will come from the US or Europe. The decision also comes as Russian gas giant Gazprom announced Wednesday that it would cut its supplies of gas to Poland and Bulgaria. Washington says it has placed seven countries, including China and Russia, on its annual priority watch list for intellectual property protection and enforcement. The Office of the U.S. Trade Representative said in a statement Wednesday that it's keeping China on the list uh, due mainly to concerns about the effectiveness of revisions to its patent, copyright and criminal laws enacted last year. It added Russia remains on the list because of ongoing challenges, including infringement on copyright, trademarks and a lack of enforcement. Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and Romania have been removed from the list due to improvements made in their practices of IP rights. Now, in the meantime, top U.S. infectious disease expert Anthony Fauci has said that the U.S. has left the full-blown pandemic phase, but that the virus still poses a threat. 
Now, in an interview with CNN, he added that the country is currently in a transition phase heading toward normality. Meanwhile, it has been estimated that 60 to 80 percent of the EU population could have been infected with COVID-19. Now, that's according to Reuters on Wednesday, quoting an EU health commissioner speaking at a news conference. According to the EU Public Health Agency, the number of reported cases is equal to about 30 percent of Europe's population. But if unreported infections are added, cases could be as high as 350 million, about 77 percent of people in Europe. Now, the nation's daily COVID-19 tally has been under 100,000 on a daily basis. Now, while numbers are declining, the country is still reporting high amount of cases. Now, the Presidential Transition Committee's chair announced a new system that will be set up for not only this pandemic, but future infectious diseases as well. Kim do reports. Chairman of the Presidential Transition Committee, An Cher Su, says the UN administration will decide on the fate of outdoor mask requirements in late May. As of now, we still have more infections than other countries. That's why we can't compare ourselves to other countries that have lifted outdoor mask mandates. That said, when the situation is right, maybe people can take masks off outdoors, but put them back when going indoors. On Wednesday, An, who also sits as the chair for the COVID-19 response division at the committee, shared the incoming government's 100-day pandemic plan. By the end, the country will be prepared to respond to an expected rebound in COVID-19 infections come this fall. The roadmap consists of four pillars, the first one being a science-based antivirus policy. Now, virus prevention measures will be based on clear scientific data. And to do this, a new big data platform, which will be shared with citizens, is going to be formed to analyze the data through AI. The other pillars are establishing a sustainable infectious disease response system, providing protection to high-risk and vulnerable populations, and securing vaccine and treatments. Under the four pillars, the incoming government will pursue a total of 34 tasks over varying time frames. One of the first starters in the first 30 days is to launch a large-scale antibody check to better assess the prevalence of infection and secure enough hospital beds for the next wave. Within 50 days, it plans to increase the responsibility of local clinics and hospitals in responding to COVID-19 and set up a new presidential advisory body for infectious diseases. Within 100 days, it aims to revise social distancing criteria. The new system will also introduce social distancing measures that do not classify businesses based on types, but on the level of exposure to infections in general. On Friday, An is expected to take the mic again to explain the UN administration's COVID-19 relief policy for compensating the businesses that were hurt due to social distancing measures. Kim Do-yeon, Arirang News. It's now time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deeper into the biggest news stories in the spotlight right now. Globally, we're seeing a huge decline in the number of COVID-19 cases, but as experts have warned, there needs to be more preparation for future resurgences. That's right. So what are some of the concerns moving forward and how can the global community prepare for another possible surge? Now, for this, we connect with Ben Kaling, Chair Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Hong Kong, joining us today. Uh, good morning to you, Professor. Good morning. Uh, let's kind of start off with uh, what's going on in Shanghai right now. We know that uh, they're seeing for weeks a massive surge in cases. And this is despite the fact that, I mean, let's face it, China put in some of the stricter uh, measures in place. Seeing what's going on in Shanghai, uh, what's going on in maybe in Beijing right now as well, is it just inevitable that we just got to have the you know, Omicron variant before it settles down again? I think in Shanghai, we've seen a large number of cases. I think there were 20,000 plus per day, but the numbers are coming down just recently, the last few days. It looks like they may be able to get on top of it and ultimately bring case numbers back down to zero, only having maybe one or 2% of their population 
infected, which of course is a very low proportion of a population to be infected. So it shows that it may be possible to be at extreme cost, and most other parts of the world have decided that, that that's not feasible and, and vaccines provide a more sustainable long-term solution to dealing with COVID than these very stringent public health measures in, in Shanghai and I think in Beijing now as well. And globally, we're seeing a general decline in the number of cases, but there are still uh, worries uh, surrounding the uh, recombinant variants of Omicron. Are we seeing any new cases flare up in any other parts of the world? Yeah, I think the one that we're looking out for at the moment is BA4. But of course, from week to week, there's different things reported in the news. So you ask me again next week, it might be something different again. But for now, it looks like BA4 may be the next strain that spreads around the world. But I don't think it will have as much impact as BA1 and then BA2 have had because we have a lot of immunity in our populations now from infections and from vaccinations. So, so right now, COVID will be less of a threat. In next winter, maybe we'll be back again with another new variant. Um, we'll have to be careful again. But I think we can, we can uh, relax a little bit now because we, we've passed the worst uh, with, with Omicron. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of us are kind of getting, uh, you know, losing touch on uh, how many different uh, variants there could be uh, moving forward here. Uh, something to kind of look forward to, I believe, in May. The U.S. is going to be hosting uh, the Global COVID-19 Summit. Uh, what do you think are some of the biggest issues that need to be discussed in that very event? Well, I'm sure there'll be a lot of different things being discussed, a, a wide range of, of topics. Um, of course, the reviews of how governments have done in their response to COVID would, would be a really important thing to, to start looking at and start assessing. For me, that the biggest question going forward is vaccines. When are we going to have updates to the vaccines with the latest strains? Because, of course, the vaccines that we're using today are using the strains from two years ago. And we need to update them sooner or later, I think sooner. Um, and then we need to think about how much we should be using vaccines, how many doses, a year, which groups are the, the, the priority groups and so on. And, and, and there's a lot of research that needs to be done to feed into those kind of decisions and recommendations. Um, Professor Cowling, now, uh, South Korea is soon set to remove uh, mask mandates, or there's a discussion about it at least. And well, what's the, how is the conversation uh, going on in other parts of the world? Well, of course, a mandate is, is when everybody has to do it. And that's a stronger thing than just a recommendation to say that people should wear masks, we encourage it, um, but, but it's not uh, mandatory. And I think we're going to see in, in Korea and elsewhere, of course, is that the mandates will be rescinded, but some people will still choose to wear masks and they're going to do their own personal risk assessment. I think that's a more sustainable solution going forwards. I don't think that actually masks do much good outdoors. It's an easy thing that we could we could relax and it won't have much impact on the, the pandemic. Masks in public transport might be something that we keep in place for a little bit longer because that's a crowded indoor setting. Uh, lots of people, if we have masks there, maybe it would do a little bit of good and just help the numbers to, to come down a little bit further before we relax that as well. So, Professor Kelly, I mean, another thing that's kind of another concern that's being raised right now is uh, some of the symptoms uh, that are coming now for those that have either COVID or are currently with COVID. And one of the weird symptoms that's been coming out is the fact that some people are getting, you know, basically diabetes. They're diagnosed with diabetes. Why is that the case? And why are we seeing so many people with diabetes after being, uh, you know, con contracting uh, COVID-19? I don't think it's a large number, but there have been a number of studies which established that there is an increased risk of, of being diagnosed with diabetes after having COVID, but it's a low risk, it's not a high risk. And it's one of many different things that are grouped together under the umbrella of long COVID. Some people may lose their smell or taste for a period of time. That's not, not so serious. Other people have trouble uh, walking up the stairs after they recover from COVID, that's serious. And then as you mentioned, there's conditions like diabetes, maybe other chronic medical conditions that develop. And I, I think we, we don't have a full understanding of how frequently this happens, and particularly how much it happens in people who've been vaccinated. Because a lot of the scientific research that's been done and reported today is actually research that was done a year ago before vaccines were available. And I suspect that there's less long COVID now in people who are vaccinated than there was maybe in the earlier days of the pandemic. 
before vaccines were available. But we'll, we'll see. That's really a very active area of, of scientific research around the world. Professor Ben Carling, thank you so much for your insights today. Thank you. President-elect Yoon suk yeol met with various global opinion leaders on Wednesday. Holding talks with Edwin Fauna, founder of U.S. think tank The Heritage Foundation, Yoon said President Biden's upcoming visit to Seoul will be an opportunity to bolster the bilateral alliance in a comprehensive manner. The incoming South Korean leader also met with Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum, and discussed the fourth industrial revolution and cooperation. Also, Yoon held talks with the French ambassador to South Korea and congratulated President Emmanuel Macron's re-election. The duo also touched upon the upgrading cooperation on various fronts, including security, politics, economy and culture. Now, Tokyo launched a formal protest with the South Korean government over the plans to conduct research activities on Tokdo. Now, the complaint was reported Wednesday by the Sankei Shimbun, citing a Japanese government official. According to the report, Seoul plans to use drones to survey the island's topographical features and nearby waters. Now, South Korea's foreign ministry dismissed the complaint, reiterating that Tokdo is indisputably South Korean territory historically, geographically, and under international law. Now, the Democratic Party's controversial prosecution reform bill failed to pass on Wednesday due to the main opposition People Power Party dragging the debate on for seven hours right up to Wednesday's midnight deadline. But the ruling DP will use their majority in Parliament to submit the bill again on Saturday before eventually passing it. And this time, there will be no debate. Lee kyung has the details. The filibuster went on until the midnight at the National Assembly on Wednesday, with the People Power Party trying to block the passage of a bill aimed at reducing and eventually scrapping the prosecution's rights to investigate. The PPP's full leader, Kwon Song-dong, kicked off the marathon session. For two hours, he questioned the integrity of the bill, as well as the Democratic Party, which had pushed the bill through on its own during an earlier Judiciary Committee meeting. The DP has designed the unjust bill and is now trying to pass it by taking advantage of it holding the majority in Parliament. It also brought the parliamentary rules as seen in the Judiciary Committee meeting earlier. The DP hit back, condemning the PPP for backtracking on an agreement on the bill after raising concerns over lack of public consensus. The DP, despite holding the majority of seats, cannot force the filibuster to stop in the middle of the debate, as it is nine seats short of the three-fifths of votes needed to do so. Instead, as soon as the plenary session began, it pushed through the bill, bringing forward the parliamentary provisional session expiration date from May 5th to Wednesday, effectively forcing the filibuster to end by midnight. The DP's plan is to resubmit the bill on Saturday in an extra plenary session. In that case, the bill will be put straight to a vote, skipping any debate which is considered to be already over. This means the law will already be in place before President-elect Yoon suk yeol takes office when he will have the right to veto. Yoon, who has strongly opposed the bill while he was serving as the chief prosecutor, has remained reserved on the matter so far. But his chief secretary is planning on proposing Yoon that he conducts a public referendum on the matter after he takes office. In the meantime, the prosecution says it will immediately take the law, if passed, before the Constitutional Court for judgment on a competence dispute and suspend it from taking effect. The PPP had already filed an injunction with the Constitutional Court. Young Eun, Arirang News. It's time for Global Insights, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. Now, one of the major changes South Korea's president-elect Yoon suk yeol is likely to bring with the next administration is the country's energy policy. The government will change which means the, method, the methods used to procure sustainable and green sources of energy, and these methods are likely to be significantly different. But the overall goal should be the same, which is taking the country to net zero by 2050. 
Most significantly, Yoon Sogo is expected to do a U-turn on the incumbent government's decision to phase out nuclear power. And we discuss what to expect from the next government and whether they are steps in the right direction. For this, we connect with Chong so -yong, Professor of International Studies at Korea University, and Om ji -yong, Associate Professor of uh, KAIS Business and Technology Management, as well as the Director of KAIS Center for Sustainable Development. Very warm welcome to you both, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, first of all, my question to you, Professor Chong. Now, President-elect uh, Yoon, he said that nuclear energy should make up around 30 to 35 percent of the country's source of energy. Now, first of all, is this possible in terms of South Korea's capacity and infrastructure? I mean, what kind of changes will this have to involve? Well, it has been all the time the possible, even the before uh, uh, the Moon administration started some years ago. But however, the situation was that uh, because of the energy transition policy of the Moon's administration, actually there is a serious concerns about the phasing of the nuclear power plant. But if you take a look at actually current uh, you know energy pro you know energy mix uh, plan uh, that has been uh, developed by the incoming the Yun administration, uh, nuclear uh, should play a very vital role in the sense that we already had enough capacity actually to restore the, uh, all the, the action plans. Uh, uh, again, and then uh, currently that uh, you know new government uh, will uh, you know you know push the uh, process of the build uh, Shinhan three and four, and then uh, by before the 2003 there will be another continuous efforts actually to uh, rebuild uh, another nuclear power plants, and then uh, as I said. Uh, we already have uh, enough uh, infrastructure. Even under the uh, Moon's administration, this uh, this administration uh, continuously uh, talking to the you know other foreign resources to export our technology of nuclear, uh, including the countries in the Middle East. Uh, everything says that it is all possible. I see, and Professor Om um, now. Former President Lee myung -bak, he actually spearheaded this move towards nuclear energy. And then, of course, that move was reversed by President Moon. And now we're undoing that reversal. So what advantages would nuclear power bring at this point? Is it going to help us achieve our carbon zero goals, zero carbon goals? Yeah, uh, nuclear power will help, uh, I would say, the, particularly when we pursue 2050 carbon neutrality goals. Uh, according to our recent academic paper released this week, when carbon neutrality is assisted uh, with nuclear power, we'll be able to lower policy compliance costs considerably than the other case where we rely only on uh, renewables and carbon capture and storage technologies. And nuclear assisted uh, carbon neutrality will also help, uh, we also place less stress and burden on our terrestrial and geological systems nationwide because it relieves our reliance on re renewable sources and carbon capture and storage resources, which requires significant amount of land and deep geological formations. Going back to the question of whether nuclear is helpful for 2050 carbon neutrality, yes, definitely, uh, but not for our NDC, National Determined uh, Contribution Target, uh, which is to mitigate 40% by 2030, as not so much can be done for the, uh, for, for the nuclear within eight years. And Professor Arm, another question to you. Now, concerns over waste disposal remain when it comes to nuclear energy. What kind of infrastructure or equipment is going to be needed to really safely dispose of nuclear waste? Yeah, uh, a, currently a total of 24 nuclear power units produces 14,000 bundles of spent fuels. Due to the failure in securing final waste repositories in Korea, a total of 500,000 500, bundles are stored temporarily in nuclear power plant sites. So within 10 years, several nuclear units would be fully filled, filed or with spent fuels. Something has to be done urgently. Uh, the first of all, the public acceptance to high-level radioactive waste repository is needed. Special Act on High-Level Radioactive Waste Management was proposed in December last year, and Congress should pass the bill, and the Special Act includes the establishment of independent entity that fairly undertakes high-level radioactive waste management. The alternative means to manage spent fuel is processing. As long as nuclear power generation continues, the method of storing large volumes of high-level radioactive waste in underground facilities may not be 
sustainable, sustainable, not to mention the public acceptance issue. So uh, where are you now about the processing technology? Since 1997, Korea has invested a, a, a total of 800 billion won for developing a technology that can reduce the amount of nuclear waste by 95%, but it was stopped. Uh, and then this, this, this was because, in, uh, in the policy, uh, because of the policy direction to nuclear phase out. And, uh, and at the end of last year, uh, the government adequacy review committee finally decided to, uh, to resume the support for the spent fuel, nuclear fuel processing R&D projects. And that the technology is called pyro SFR technology. Uh, it, this is combination of uh, pyro processing and SFR uh, sodium cold uh, fast reactor technology. And they can help reduce the, uh, the significant volume of spent fuel uh, 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 produced from the nuclear power plant. And going back to you, Professor Chong, it seems, well, as you said that there's definitely capacity uh, for South Korea to really ramp up its use of nuclear energy. And the president-elect, he said that restarting nuclear projects, that could potentially create a lot of job opportunities and also strengthen exports for the country. What kind of benefits are you expecting to see? Well, first of all, as you said, that I think that uh, nuclear technology can be one of the uh, driving the technology in terms of the job creation uh, and then economic growth of Republic Korea, in addition to its benefits uh, contributing to carbon neutrality. Uh, first of all, as we uh, still recall that uh, Korea already made uh, great efforts and a deal with uh, some countries in the Middle East uh, back to the Lee myung administration when uh, South Korea made a deal with the UAE to export the nuclear actual power plant technologies and other infrastructure. And then I know that uh, currently another Middle East country, including Saudi Arabia, has been talking uh, already with the Republic of Korea about the possibility of the uh, commissioning the another uh, big scale of the nuclear power project. Uh, so therefore, we already see the tensible uh, you know, almost uh, you know, possible uh, deal uh, that is coming uh, to us, uh, and then uh, uh, you know, Yun's administration's policy on nuclear will help that this. In addition, uh, we cannot uh, you know forget to say that you know because of the uh, Ukraine situation, uh, then the Russia may not be able to participate in the global nuclear market, and that will also I think uh, help. South Korea to further expand its uh, you know, opportunities to export the nuclear power plant uh, technologies, which will eventually help South Korea to find, create more jobs and then uh, grow its economy. And Professor Ahm, it seems that the president-elect is now also, uh, he plans to make a move away from wind and tidal energy, which is something that this incumbent administration has been pursuing. And rather, the next administration is going to focus more on solar energy. So uh, what is the reason for this move? So I would say uh, there is no silver bullet. Uh, so renewables, either, uh, uh, either solar PV or wind, that also should go with other uh, technology options. But uh, when it comes to the issue of solar PV uh, versus wind, actually the, uh, globally, the economic feasibility of solar power has been significantly improved compared to wind power. Uh, globally, new annual investment in solar PV photovoltaic uh, exceeded uh, that in wind power for the first time in 2020. And the levelized cost of electricity, which is the measure of technology cost for power generation, decreased by 85% over the, next, over the past 10 years for solar PV, but only about 50% for wind. Now in many parts of the world, including Korea, solar electricity is cheaper than wind electricity, and it is going to be more so going forward. And Professor Chung, well, for the last four or five years, we've heard mostly about uh, hydrogen energy and hydrogen power, hydrogen cars, all sorts of hydrogen related projects. But does a change in government now mean that the Moon government's hydrogen power plans are going to lose steam? Well, uh, I just want to make sure that uh, I don't think uh, incoming administration will change the, uh, you know, carbon neutral policy tra uh, trajectory in general. You know, I, I don't think so. Uh, but the question is uh, whether or not the current plan are feasible 
and practical enough to bring the uh, you know some people of Korea to meet the target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 40 percent as planned. That's the question. In that regard, that the hydrogen will remain as the one of the viable technology for sure. We know that uh, some of the global market size, such as hydrogen turbine, its size will grow the 14th more than the, what we are having now in year 2013. So in that regard, that, that I think that the uh, Republic of Korea can uh, cooperate with uh, not only the United States, also some of the other European countries who might be interested in the bring their, their resources on developing hydrogen technologies and so that we can eventually expand the market of the hydrogen in the world. And Professor Ahm, um, of course, procuring energy security is very important for South Korea. But another major environmental issue that the UN administration will have to tackle is air pollution. That's fine dust. Now, heavy concentration levels of fine dust hasn't improved um, over the last few years, despite the incumbent government forming a special presidential committee and rolling out all sorts of measures, really, to reduce traffic and heavy em emission heavy cars. What further steps do you think we need? Okay, uh, I think that not, not only the mitigation of domestic pollutants, but also the cooperation between Korea and China to tackle transboundary air pollution is urgent. Although we, ha we have implemented domestic emergency reduction measures during winter, external factors that increase the amount of fine dust flowing in from abroad, particularly in winter, are also another main causes. So preemptive response itself is fundamentally difficult in Korea. Let me approach it to this issue in two ways. First, mitigation side. One good news is that air pollution intensive sectors such as industrial power generation and transportation sectors are now di directly affected by carbon mitigation policies. That is, climate policies started to provide air pollution co-benefits. The steel industry is also making major investment in reduced fine dust and the chemical industry is developing and investing in technology to reduce volatile organic compounds emission. The second is about international cooperation. We need to strengthen policy coordination and information exchange on transboundary air pollution issues with China at bilateral or multilateral levels, such as Northeast Asia Clean Air Partnership. Based on mutual understanding, the two countries will be able to further strengthen our capability to respond to air pollution issues. And lastly, uh, Professor Chung, now, we have a new government coming in, there'll be a new environment minister. So what kind of role do you uh, hope to see her play? And what do you think will be some of the key um, agendas that she pushes for it to tackle the key environmental challenges that we face here in South Korea? Right. Um, I know that uh, uh, you know, minister uh, nominee uh, uh, is a very uh, capable person, uh, not only to manage the uh, you know, administrative matters, but also, uh, you know, uh, push the uh, implementation of the policies within her ministry in case uh, she would pass the uh, sort of the public hearing process. Oh, well, uh, oh, first of all, we should know that uh, climate and energy issues cannot only handle the, by the one single ministry, ministry environment because it involves the various uh, issues, including the Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In the end, that's why we, we all say that it's the uh, matter for the president himself. So I, first of all, hope that uh, President-elect Yoon, uh, he, he will uh, lead all these discussions within the government. And then, uh, in case of the Ministry of Environment, I'm sure that the Ministry of Environment can play a very important role because this has been a key ministry in developing the policy of carbon neutrality under uh, Moon's administration. However, uh, I hope that they will focus more on monitoring, assessment, and also handling with the uh, transparency issues with the uh, United Nations Climate Change Convention. So these are the uh, some of the key issues that the uh, incoming uh, you know minister uh, needs to further focus on, so that in the end, overall carbon neutrality policy will make the best uh, you know, outcome uh, during the uh, Yun's administration. That was Chong so -yong, Professor of International Studies at Korea University and Om ji -yong, Associate Professor of KAIS Business and Technology Management as well as Director of KAIS Center for Sustainable Development. Thank you both so much for your time today. Thank, Thank you. you so much.
Business sentiment among South Korean companies has rebounded for the first time in four months. The Bank of Korea says its business sentiment index for all industries stands at 86 points in April, up three points from March, but still below 100, meaning the overall mood is still pessimistic. Now, the central bank attributed the increase to the drop in COVID-19 cases, the lifting of social distancing measures, the recovery in domestic demand and solid exports. Among non-manufacturing sectors, the index went up by four points to 85, reaching its highest figure in 11 years. Now, that was led by the growth in overseas travel services and the wholesale and retail industries. Now, for manufacturing companies, the index is also up by three points to 87. Now, for the first time in over a decade, a change in South Korea's top business group ranking. While Samsung remains the top spot, SK became the runner-up for the first time thanks to robust semiconductor business. More firms were also added to the listing, including a cryptocurrency exchange operator. Um ji provides a closer look. For the first time in 12 years, the rankings of the top five South Korean conglomerates have changed. South Korea's Fair Trade Commission on Wednesday released a new list of the 76 largest business groups with assets of 5 trillion won or about 4 billion U.S. dollars. The five largest business groups by size in terms of total assets are now Samsung, SK, Hyundai Motor Group, LG and Lotte in that order. SK Group became the second largest conglomerate for the first time thanks to its solid semiconductor sales and an expansion of petroleum projects with its assets last year standing at around 230 billion US dollars. Automaker Hyundai Motor Group, which was replaced by SK Group, fell one place to third spot with 203 billion dollars in assets. Samsung remained in first place with assets of around $382 billion. The Fair Trade Commission said eight more firms were added to the list, including Tunamu, the operator of the country's number one cryptocurrency exchange, Upbit. The antitrust regulator said about $4.6 billion of deposits made by its customers led to the firm being added to the list. There is no legal grounds to exclude customer deposits from its assets. Customer deposits of Upbit are under the control of Dunamu, and it gets economic benefit from that. The antitrust watchdog also said that the growth of IT firms is noticeable. South Korean web service giant Kakao claimed 15th place going up from 18th with around $25 billion in assets. Naver, the country's top internet search engine, also ranked 22nd, up from 27th, with assets of roughly $15 billion. The firms on the list are mandated to disclose detailed information of their management and business activities from this year and also face stricter filing rules starting May 1st. Om ji Arirang News. Now, Korea's population is getting older, and with fewer babies being born, it's actually shrinking. Now, in February, data shows there were fewer than 20,000 new births, and deaths rose to the highest level on record. Kim hyun sung has the details. Deaths sharply climb, while births continue to decline. Statistics Korea on Wednesday reported that there were nearly 30,000 deaths in South Korea this February. That's the highest tally ever logged since Statistics Korea started compiling monthly demographic data in 1983. It also marks the steepest on-year rise, up 22.7 percent from the same period last year. An official from Statistics Korea said the number of deaths was driven mainly by the aging population and also partly by COVID-19. Meanwhile, the number of births have been on the decline for 28 months in a row. There were a little over 20,000 newborns in the month of February, falling 3.2 percent compared to a year ago. So in February, there was a population drop of more than 8,500. South Korea's aging population is also affecting demographic movement. 
Around 587,000 people relocated in March, a 20 percent drop from the same time last year. With the share of people in their 20s and 30s declining and people in their 60s or older rising, more and more people are opting to stay in one place rather than move around. So this March marked the slowest population movement in the same month for the past 47 years. For matrimony, the number of marriages went up while divorces saw a decline. There was a 2 percent rise in newlyweds in February. But that's hardly a recovery from the same month last year when marriages dropped more than 21 percent with COVID-19 driving away weddings. Divorces went down 8 percent. Kim Hyun-sung, Arirang News. South Korean boy band Stray Kids remained in the Billboard 200 chart for five straight weeks. The group's latest mini-album, Ordinary, ranked 117th, up 14 slots from the week before. The album topped the chart last month, making Stray Kids the third K-pop act to achieve that feat. Ordinary surpassed 100 million, 100 million streams on Spotify on Monday, 37 days after its release. This comes ahead of the boys' second world tour, which starts in Seoul on Friday. The late Samsung Group chair Lee Gonyi was an avid art collector, and when he passed away, his family donated many of the rare and exquisite pieces to South Korea's museums and galleries. Now it's been a year since the donation was made, and to mark that special occasion, an exhibition has opened in Seoul. Our Kim bo provides us a sneak peek. Welcome to the Great Collector's Own Art Exhibition at the National Museum of Korea. The four-month exhibition titled A Collector's Invitation will present 355 selected pieces out of a vast array of more than 20,000 antiques and works of art donated by the late Samsung Group chairman Lee gun -hee. To celebrate the first anniversary since he donated the pieces, a joint remembrance exhibition was organized by seven art museums, including the National Museum of Korea and the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art. Dubbed the donation of the century, the art pieces span the prehistoric period to the 21st century and include books, pottery, paintings, calligraphic works, and others. Two exhibitions have already been held since the donation was made last year, and this time 309 pieces have been newly unveiled. Among them, an expert says three items are noticeable. The story of the Chung family's filial son is a calligraphy Chung Yak Yong wrote when he was in exile in Kangjin, requested by his neighbor to write about his dead son's filial piety. Three years later, he again was asked to write about his neighbor's daughter-in-law's educational philosophy. This is Chung's representative piece showing masterful calligraphy. Monet's work shows his own principle of studying the effects of light on color. Another notable art piece, the national treasure clearing after rain on Mount Inwang by Joseon era painter Chung Seon is also shown. Yet to minimize the possible damage from exposure to light, it will only be on display for one month. The culture minister hopes the exhibition could be a chance to think about our cultural heritage. I believe we could again realize the importance of cultural heritage and the attitude toward it through this donation. I hope this exhibition marking the first anniversary of the donation could suggest to us a new paradigm of societal donation. The exhibition will go until August 28th at the National Museum of Korea. Kim Bo-kyung, Arirang News. For a look at the news from around the world, we now turn to our Matthew Ashley standing by at the Arang Newsroom. Good morning, Matthew. Good morning to you guys. Good morning to you, Matthew. Now let's start things off with an update from Myanmar as a court there has handed yet another sentence to its former leader. Indeed, and according to sources from the military-ruled nation, deposed leader Aung San Suu Kyi was given a five-year sentence for corruption. Now, the verdict reached, was reached behind closed doors on Wednesday in the capital of Naypyidaw, reportedly just moments after procedures or proceedings started. The 76-year-old former leader was found guilty of accepting 11.4 kilograms of gold and cash payments amounting to 600,000 US dollars. This latest conviction takes her total prison sentence to 11 years, and she still faces another 11 corruption charges 
each carrying a maximum 15-year sentence. Moving on to India, as a massive fire in New Delhi is into its second day. The fire started on Tuesday at the city's Balswa landfill, which reaches heights taller than 17-storey building and spans an area bigger than 50 football fields. Fire engines rushed to the landfill in an attempt to extinguish the blaze, as the city has been engulfed in smoke. This comes as the Indian capital is in the middle of a record-shattering heatwave, which experts say helped to start the fire. Planned for closure 10 years ago, the Balswa landfill still sees more than 200 or 2,000 tons of waste dumped there every day. Three other landfills around New Delhi have also caught fire recently. Italian children may soon be allowed to take the surname of both parents. This follows a ruling made by the country's constitutional court on Wednesday. It overturns a tradition where all newborns are automatically named after their father. According to a court statement, the current practice is, quote, discriminatory and harmful to the identity of the child. The ruling notes that parents can choose the order of the surnames unless they agree that only one surname should be taken. In order for the ruling to be final, new legislation must be approved by Parliament. The Netherlands on Wednesday saw its city streets filled with festival goers as the country celebrated King's Day. The festival went ahead without COVID-19 restrictions for the first time since 2019. Participants wore orange in honour of the ruling House of Orange and to mark the birthday of King Willem Alexander, who turned 55 years old. The event started Tuesday night with a King's Eve party, while King's Day itself saw an abundance of open-air markets and loud music across the country. Festivities traditionally continue late into the night, with most people expected to return to work on Thursday. The Brazilian Football Confederation named its first female director on Tuesday. According to reports, architect Luisa Rosa was appointed to the role which will include the management of new construction projects. Rosa previously worked for the 2014 Brazilian World Cup organizing committee and the 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games held in Rio de Janeiro. The 33-year-old is also involved in the architecture projects for the World Cup in Qatar later this year. Rosa will also oversee the creation of 15 football development centers, as well as the expansion of the headquarters of, the, of Brazil's national football team. Good morning. It was so stuffy yesterday with very bad air quality in the capital area. Well, things have improved, but many western regions will still need to be mindful of bad air due to the lingering yellow dust. There will be nothing but sunshine for most of the day, which will boost UV rays to very high levels before clouds move in late in the afternoon. But that also means allergy sufferers will have a harsh day. Tree pollen levels are highest in the morning from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., so brace for some rough start. Meanwhile, southern provinces are having a foggy morning, so please tread with care. Morning lows are 1 to 5 degrees lower than the same time yesterday today. And you know, it's easy to come down with a cold when temperature fluctuates like this. Highs will be similar to a couple of degrees higher than yesterday, and Seoul and Daegu both will be topping out at 24 degrees Celsius this afternoon. Well, light nationwide rain is in the forecast tomorrow from dawn into the morning. Then the month of May will start on a brighter note. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe.
That wraps up our newscast for this morning, but we will be back tomorrow for our Friday's edition of New Day at Arirang. Thanks as always for tuning in, but stick around for more updates throughout the day. Have a great rest of your day wherever you are, and as always, take care.